when we talk about the shield of faith, how large our shield depends on how much faith we have. We can have a small shield, we can have a big shield. But it comes down to how much faith do we have. And then we're moving on today to the sword of the Spirit. If someone would please read Ephesians chapter 6 and 17, Ephesians 6, 17, and someone else, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16. Revelation 1, 16, and someone else, first read Ephesians 6, 17. So take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Some people question the Bible, say, well, it's hard to understand, and this and that and the other thing. The Word of God interprets itself. What is the uh, uh, sword of the Spirit? It is the Word of God. What about Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16? Revelation 1, 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And here we are seeing uh, Christophany, a revealing of Christ in the book of Revelation, and it says, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. For the Roman soldier, as we've already said, Paul is re re referring something to the Ephesians, something that they can grasp and understand. He's using the, so the weapons and the armor of the Roman soldier as an illustration so they can grasp spiritual concepts. And when we look at the Roman soldier, his occupation required a sword. How would any one of us love to go to battle, all ready for war, but we don't have a sword, we don't have a dagger, we have the helmet, we have the breastplate, we have the sandals, and maybe we have the shield, but we don't have the sword. Probably none of us would love to be in that situation. Why? Because there's someone, there's a real enemy out there trying to kill us. And we want something to defend ourselves, whether it be in an offensive manner or a defensive position. And the sword is perfect for that. The shield is fine, it can be used in both, but it's not going to do damage like a sword's going to be. I don't know about you, but somebody's breaking into my house, I don't want to beat them off with a rock. I'd rather have a shotgun. Just, let's make it a little bit easier. Well, the Roman soldier is the same way. He may not have had a shotgun, but he had a sword. It was double-sided. It was sharp. It was meant to harm anybody that got in his way. It was a powerful offensive weapon. And any commentary you read, they'll talk about the sword of the spirit being an offensive weapon. But if you think about it, it was also a defensive weapon. For the person who maybe wanted to stay back a little bit, if somebody came charging at him with another sword, you were using it to block it. Then you were going on the offensive when you had the opportunity. So it worked both ways. It was an offensive weapon, and it was a defensive weapon. And if we look at one of the, at the soldier's uniform, it was probably one of the most important pieces of the outfit, as we've already said, because it's the one that did the most damage. Sandals were great. They held him in place. The helmet was great. It protected his head. Breastplate was great. It protected his heart and lungs and liver. But they all protected him. It weren't really anything he could fight with. The sword was important because that was the valuable piece that he could fight and defend himself with. That's what he could use to take a blunt kill. If he was out in the wilderness and he got stranded in the woods, guess what? I'm sure we all like to eat. And at some point, he would need to eat as well. So even if the enemy wasn't around, he would have used that sword to kill an animal, to cut it up, to prepare for cooking. So it was valuable in more ways than one. The sword was extremely important when it came to the Roman soldier. When we are looking at the Word of God, Paul likes the Roman out the sword of the Spirit to the Roman soldier and his sword. But our weapons, are they fleshly? Are they physical? No. Our weapons are not physical, but rather they are spiritual. I'm trying to see 
see, I know we have it in the top of our notes. I wanted to read the reference real quick. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to the breaking down of strongholds. Obviously, I'm missing it at the top, but they're spiritual. There's something to help us in our spiritual journey. If the devil comes against me, it's not a physical sword that I can't whip out that says, here's the sword of the Spirit. That's not the case. The Word of God instructs us what our sword is. It says that it is the Word of God. We've already read that this morning. And our sword, which is the Word of God, it is not like any other sword out there. It is not one that can dupl be duplicated. If we go down through history or uh, even folklore, you might think of Excalibur with uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table or some other famous sword that was out there that there was none like it. Well, even those swords, whether real or fake, cannot compare to our sword. We've already mentioned that our armor is a living armor. Our spiritual armor is alive. It grows with our, spiritual, with our spirituality. Do we have any scripture to back this up? Absolutely. How about Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12? Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Is that what you're getting there? Nine times out of ten, yes. 
Okay. The reason I say that is I do believe that if Christ wanted to, he could come down and make himself real deep to someone if he really wanted to. There are accounts of Muslims in nations, uh, Muslim countries, where they are completely blocked off that were coming to Christ because Jesus came to them, they say. There are instances in the Bible where we know that Jesus came down and visited. We know he was there with Abraham and the two other angels before he went into Sodom. But we do know this as well, that he left earth, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and nine times out of ten, it's going to be the Holy Ghost dealing with you because Jesus can't be over here dealing with you and over in China dealing with somebody over there. Right now, Jesus Christ is not omnipresent. He's only omnipresent or everywhere at one time through the Holy Ghost. So it's the Holy Ghost that's going to make the Word of God alive in our lives when we're listening to preaching, when we're reading our Bibles, when we're spending time in prayer. He is the one that makes the Word of God alive in our lives. He is the one that fights and protects the church. Now when we look at the Word of God, we find that when it comes to the Word of God itself, as redundant as that sounds, the Word of God, there is two parts to it. There's the Logos and the Rhema. The Logos is simply the written Word of God. The Bible, like we have here. The Rhema is the living Word of God. The Word that, the living Word of God is Jesus Christ. We find that in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. If someone would please find Matthew 5, 18. Jesus. 
And which account is his name and the pardon? And where are you thinking about Jesus? Where did Jesus, what was the situation going on that Jesus used the written word of God as a defense? When, he, when Peter what, cut his ear off. Go ahead. No, that's fine. Go ahead, brother. In the wilderness. In the wilderness, exactly. Do you remember what was going on in the wilderness, of brother, to give us a little bit of a background? When Satan came to He came together. To tempt him. To tempt him, absolutely. And we find that he tempts him not just once, not just twice, but three times the devil attacks the Son of God. And three times the Son of God wards him off by using Scripture. He said that if he sat him up on a high pinnacle, showed him all the temples of the world and all the countries of the world, and told him that he would give him if he would bow down and worship him. Jesus told him, and everything's slipping. Well, what day was he in when he tempted him with the bread? Wasn't that the bread? Well, we know that he tempted him three different times. We don't know the days. Oh, we know. just know that he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> And Jesus told him and rebuked him on three different occasions, get thee behind me, Satan. And he used the word of God in each one of those situations. If the Son of God used the word of God, the written word of God, as a defense, when the enemy came in, how much more should we use it? If it was good enough for the Son of God, then it's good enough for us. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, we know that there are times when it just seems unbearable that the Holy Ghost will raise up a standard or a wall of protection. But there are times when we have to fight as well. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that it's all um, roses and it's time to sit back and relax. No, but rather we find that we are soldiers. We're to fight. You Keep know, pressing on. Excuse me. You know a lot of people that accept Christ. Uh, they think everything is going to go peace and cream. And it actually, to me, still happens. That, that you don't even... I'm going to say something you don't even have nothing to follow with. So you have something, you might get a letter in the mail or some goofy app and it's coming against you. And a lot of people don't understand that, and then that's when they give up and study on Christ. Absolutely, and part of that is a fault of our own preachers today because we are preaching a love gospel where You're if right. you accept Jesus Christ, everything, He will solve all your issues, He will solve all your problems. When in actuality, yes, while he may help us through, he will not do away with all of them. Not everything's going to be peaches and cream. Right. It's more or less if you got an issue, you, you, you pray about it, you read about it, and, and you stay stick with the Lord, and he'll see you through that. Absolutely. A lot easier, and then you make a decision to try and do it, and you're wrong. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. what I get out of it. And we go back to the Word of God, and sometimes the enemy's coming get, coming against us. But we know that we rebuke him in the name of Jesus and command him to flee. He'll have to flee. When it comes to our shield of faith, that's where that comes into play as well. When those fiery darts come in, it's not just to quench some of the fiery darts, but it's to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. How do we build up our faith? Well, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. So it's the word of God that builds up our faith. It draws us closer to God. It enhances our armor. It gives us um, duration to push through the battle that's coming against us. And it gives us the ability to quench every attack that the, that the enemy is throwing against us. And that's why it's important that we do exactly what 2 Timothy 2.15 states. What does 2 Timothy 2.15 state? And while someone's finding that, please read someone else find Matthew 24, 32. Matthew 24, 32. So you can show that self approval of God, the woman that you did not see a shame, where he devises the word of truth. So when we look at 2 Timothy 2, 15, it says, Congratulations, you have just accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You may now pass go, you may now collect $200, sit down and enjoy the rest of your life. No. It says, Study. To show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed to be ashamed? No. That needed not to be ashamed. Why? Because he's been rightly dividing the word of truth. How has he done that? By studying the word of God, by studying his sword, knowing it, sharpening the edges, 
So when the enemy comes in, he's not attacking you with a dull blade. But he's been studying it that he may know it. What does Jesus instruct his disciples to do in Matthew 24 and 32? Now learn a parable of a fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, he knows the summer is not. I so likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. I love this parable. And the reason being is the only parable that Jesus Christ actually told and instructed his disciples to learn. But here we find in the word of God that even Jesus Christ himself instructed his disciples to learn the word of God. Learn it. Why? Because when you learn something, it's not just a head knowledge, but learn it that you know it in your heart, that you may apply it to your life, that you may be ready. Well, that's exactly what 2 Timothy 2.15 is guiding us towards. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Study the Word of God. Know it. And when you know it, guess what happens when you know something? What's 2 plus 2? 1. It's 1. But Dennis, if somebody comes in and tries to tell you that it's four, if you know that it's one, well, no one's going to change your mind. You know then know that it's one, whether you're right or whether you're wrong in this case. But when you know the Word of God, and you've learned it, and there's something that you know that you know that you know that you know that there's no change in your mind, well, then you can't be persuaded. So when the enemy comes in and tries to tell you, well, that's not right. Well, you know that it's right. Your shield is up. Your faith is prepared. And you're ready to quench those fiery darts. But to be ready, we need to learn the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. And when we have studied and we know it, we have more weapons in our arsenal to fight the enemy. Because then we'll know things like John chapter 14 and 13. What does John chapter thir uh, John 14, 13 state? So what does the, our weapon, what does our sword state when we have studied it and we know it and we know it and we know it? And we have verses that we're meditating on and verses that we're memorizing. And we tuck John chapter 14 and verse 13 in our arsenal. Even if we can't remember the chapter and the verse in the book, we know that this verse exists. And when the enemy comes in, we know that whatsoever we shall ask in his name, that he will he do because he goes to the Father. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. So when situations arise and we pray, we can have faith knowing that the Word of God backs it up that whatsoever we ask in Jesus' name, it will be done. What about Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19? Matthew 16, 19. So when we're praying, and we know verses like this one here, whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever we lose on earth will be loose in heaven. When we take that to prayer, that makes a whole different dimension when we know the word of God, because we know that we can act whatsoever we shall ask in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. We know verse that if we ask before news will, it shall be done. If we ask and miss, then it won't be. But when we're praying for people's salvation, when we're praying for their deliverance, when we're people, praying for people that are bound by drugs, and we're praying that in the name of Jesus, that that addiction be loosed, and the devil be cast far from, we know that it shall be done. 
Because the Word of God says so. Because we've studied it. We've applied it to our lives. Because we know that the Word of God is quick. It is powerful. It is alive. And even though we're praying those things, and we might think, oh, it's just the Word of God. But it's the Holy Ghost that is making those things live. It's the Holy Ghost who is working our prayer request out. And there could be angels in those mix too, but our prayers are being answered because we're asking.